Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 49. I'm Steve Kwan. I'm DJ Matt. Whatever. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, we're going to talk about the guard. Yeah. yeah. Well, and how I'm now a DJ. Are you really a DJ? No. Okay. I don't even know what's actually... I just in- want you to call me that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one who's manning the mixer here. So if anyone's a DJ, I'm a DJ. That's true. Yeah. The amount of money you have to spend on setting up a sound system is just unreal. Like for us, even just setting up a podcast sound system, it's not cheap. I can only imagine if you're actually a DJ, how much money people have to sink into that whole setup. Yeah. Luckily, we just record in our old bedroom at our parents' house. The perfect sound studio. But we're working on it trying to get them to allow us to turn it into an actual studio. Yeah, we're hoping to convince them that we should like pad the walls and put up decorations and basically just completely gut and rebuild their house for the purposes of our podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes no money. That's true. It's actually a net loss endeavor. (laughs) But if you donated it... Uh, you know, we'll get to the plugs later. Okay. I so, don't even think they can donate. We no. don't have like a Patreon or a pa- or a, a bit shoot or whatever set up. No, I haven't set that up. I mean, at some point, you're, maybe we'll want you're to. You're slacking. But... I know. I know. Even though you're doing everything. Yeah. Well. But just work fucking harder, please. Buy the merch first. Yeah. Sell, sell more merch because that doubles as advertising too. Put yeah. If you want to help you. us, guys, buy a shirt, buy some patches. Let them know. Yeah. Buy a lot of shirts, a lot of patches. Yeah. An obs- like an obscene amount, way more than you could ever need. Because for every shirt you buy, we make like one dollar. Yeah, it's not a lot. <laughs> Honestly, though, it's great for exposure, right? We anything yeah. you know, we love it when we hear about stories of shirts in the wild and stuff. So yeah, if you if you're a fan of the podcast and you want to support us, it would be mean a lot actually if you'd pick up some patches or some shirts. Yeah, and if you uh, if you do have a picture of you wearing some of our stuff, we'd love to throw it on social media. Absolutely. So send those pictures in, guys. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about types of guard. Now, in the past, we've talked about the different phases of guard. So in in particular, we've talked about how the guard starts in the engagement phase where you're managing, effectively you're fighting for grips. Then it goes to the maintenance phase. So once the grips are set, then you kind of fall into what most people probably think about when you're talking about the guard. Basically, that's where your positions come from, like Delaheva guard or open guard. That's where, you know, most people think of the guard is in the maintenance phase. And then beyond that, there's the recovery phase, which is where you're in the process of having your guard passed and you've got a final opportunity to recover your guard before your opponent secures the pass. So we did a whole series of episodes on that. And going beyond that, I mean, the guard is such a crucial part of jujitsu. We could talk for, you know, days and days and days about the guard, and we probably will, (laughs) actually. But today we thought it would be good to maybe talk about the different types of guard. And when we say types of guard, we don't necessarily mean spider guard, Delaheva guard, reverse Delaheva guard. I mean, these are very particular variants, but even looking at things from a bigger picture, there are different families of guard and you can kind of group all of the common guards into these families. And each one of these families has its own considerations, its own mechanics for making it work optimally. That's the kind of stuff that we want to talk about today. So, uh, Matt, this actually comes from Rob Bernacki, your instructor, and he, when he talks about guard, he classifies the guard into a series of families. Right. Ba- basically, he's got four families. He's got hook-based guards, which basically means you use a tracking hook to control or manipulate your opponent. So, probably a, an obvious example of this would be like in-step guard or shin-to-shin guard or, or also butterfly guard, where yep. you might not necessarily be completely tying your opponent up but you have a hook that you're sticking to them and you're basically using that to check and manage their movement the second type of guards that rob talks about are clamp based guards now this is probably what you're often thinking about by default when you think of a guard this is basically where you wrap yourself around your opponent and by doing so you restrict their movement so classical closed guard is probably the most well-known example of a clamp guard you're wrapped up around your opponent and your ankles cross behind them you're basic that's basically like a pair of handcuffs that's tying your opponent to you and therefore to the ground and it's important to remember that when you do cross your ankles you create a kinetic chain within your hips which makes uh your two legs 
stronger together than they would be individually. So clamping your legs together, um, making a circle essentially with your opponent trapped inside. Also half guard is an example of this. Yeah, so this is what we've called a kinetic chain. And this is something that will probably come up more later on in this episode. So we've also, uh, Rob also talks about frame-based guards. And this is where the primary mechanic is some sort of frame that you've set up to manage the distance. Uh, common and easily understood example of a frame-based guard is the knee shield guard, right? Basically, you're, the, the main feature of that guard is that you've set up a giant frame in front of your opponent that prevents them from moving forward. So um, frame-based guards are traditionally very good as a, as a defensive weapon because they allow you to effectively neutralize someone who's really trying to press forward mm-hmm. yeah and the last type is the hybrid guard which is basically some combination of the three options that we previously mentioned a lot of modern guards fall into that category because there might be multiple mechanics at play like maybe uh, there is a, a combination of for example a frame and a clamp um, an example of a, a hybrid guard is often delahiva guard now you can play delahiva in a ton of different ways but normally you're using a combination of like hooks and frames to you know to force your opponent to turn away from you while also tracking their movements and of course what you're doing with your hands and the grips you have further add more variability to that guard yeah for example another hybrid guard would be like a reverse della heva with a spider or reverse della spider as it's referred to because you have a hook around one of their legs and you're using a uh a frame on the sleeve so it's like half spider guard half reverse della heva and then so you have the reverse Della spider. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and it's very important to just remember when you're trying to think about these guards, just remember that the, uh, the shape that your body naturally makes as you align your limbs and your frames to your opponent, basically these are going to define what kind of guard you have. So if you're using your foot as a hook, it's a hook base guard. If you're locking your legs around your partner, it's going to be a clamp base guard. If you're using frames to manage distance, it's a frame base guard. And then a hybrid would be a combination of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So hybrid guards are becoming increasingly popular. Um, and if I you had to explain why, I would say it's probably because if you've got a hybrid guard, you can set up a powerful push-pull mechanic, right? Like, you, a, like a knee shield with the ankles crossed. Or something like that, because then you've got a combination of push and pull, right? Your, your shield is a push that keeps your opponent away. Yeah. But by crossing your ankles, you can also pull them in, right? The problem, for example, with a hook-based guard by itself is, yes, you have a tracking hook, like if you're in butterfly guard, yes, you can track your opponent, but if you just have a hook in that manner, you ultimately can't really slow your opponent down very effectively unless you also add in something else. If you're playing a clamp-based guard, I mean, yes, you can maybe pull your opponent and slow them down and ground them, but you often lose your own mobility in doing so. I mean, often just by virtue of the fact that you're the one on the ground, you're probably sandwiching yourself between the, your opponent and the, the floor itself. So you often need to add something to it or else you risk getting stuck as well. And the problem with a frame-based guard, of course, is yes, you can push your opponent away, but what if they just get up and go away, right? Yeah. You don't want your, your... It's great to be able to push your <coughs> opponent away, but ultimately you do want to be able to hold them in place so they can't just abandon the position. Um, this is something that you see a lot in MMA, right? Where people just stand up. Um, if you've got just frames, then yes, you can defend a guard pass, but you also cannot control your opponent. So when you have a hybrid guard, you can often have combination push-pull, which is very good actually for breaking your opponent's posture, structure, mm-hmm. and base, uh, because because it allows you to really kind of manipulate their body in ways that you can't get with just a push or pull alone. Yeah, a great thing about like a clamp based guard is it's going to slow your opponent down. D- John Danaher will describe half guard as like a and you're basically an anchor mm-hmm. that is locking yourself around your opponent's leg, making it very hard for them to do explosive movements. And then with proper control of the hips and certain angles, hopefully you can look to create sweeping opportunities. Um, Whereas something like a hook based guard is going to have a lot of uh, elevation aspects to it. So you can really elevate your opponent out of base using hook based guards, which is something that you can't really do with other types of guard. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of 
which tool is going to be best is going to depend on a combination of factors. It's going to depend on your body type, your opponent's body type, what your strategy is, what your opponent is doing at that point in time. There is no right or wrong answer as to which type of guard is better. Um, it really just comes down to the context. So a big part of being effective on the bottom is knowing which guard is going to be most effective at any given point in time. So what we want to do here is talk a little bit about each of these different types of guards and maybe the general principles behind them, what makes them work, and when such a thing would be effective and when it won't be. Hmm. So... And, and it's really important to remember that uh, no matter what type of guard you're using, you're following the three layers of guard rule. It will really give you a uh, sort of a benchmark as to where you are in the in the exchange. Because if you're looking for a particular kind of guard, but you're you know you're purely on the defense, it might not be time to use uh, you know a specific type of guard. Instead, you got to think about using the guard to just manage distance and then try to control the grip fight. So. Um, Again, we've mentioned something that Keenan calls tempo, and it essentially just means, you know, I just think of it as when you're on the bottom, are you uh, offensive or are you purely defensive? So if you lose the engagement phase and your opponent is rushing your guard and you can only make defensive frames, you're basically purely on the defense, which is going to mean that it's going to be difficult for you to sweep and uh, submit from that position, regardless of what kind of guard you have. There's a chance you could catch your opponent in the scramble but that is not going to be an every uh you know an every case situation whereas if you can win the engagement uh, phase and win the grip battles then you're going to have a lot more uh, high success rate when it comes to sweeping and submitting because essentially the your opponent is entering your guard on your terms so this leaves a lot of opportunity to be more offensive right so uh, like i said keenan refers to it as tempo i just refer to it as you know when people are approaching uh Inside your guard, are you the offensive one? Is it your guard or are you defensive? As in, they're the one putting the pressure. They're the ones who are making the sequences happen. Yeah, the way I've described this before is who's dictating the pace? Is it you or your opponent? And one of the important reasons to understand the different types of guard is because if you use the right type of guard at the right time, you can swing the control back in your favor in terms of who's dictating the pace. Like a lot of guards, really their core feature is they allow you to slow down your opponent and reset. Um, that type of guard is very effective if you feel like you're on the losing end of the tempo. So, uh, oh, and by the way, if you want to know more about the engagement, maintenance, and retention or recovery phases of guard, we did a whole series on these, uh, episodes 16, 17, and 18, each are about these different phases of guard, so we talk extensively about the phases of guard. Definitely recommend going back and reacquainting yourself with that material if you don't recall it. Now, in terms of the actual different types of guard... Hook-based guards are the first one that we mentioned here. So a hook-based guard, again, is where you are using a some sort of hook. Usually it's going to be like the instep of your foot. And you're not necessarily trying to lock your opponent down and prevent them from moving. But rather, you're trying to maintain a constant connection with your opponent so that where they go, you go. Um, it's really, it, it's a strategy to make sure that you can prevent your opponent from closing up spaces that you don't want, and also making sure that you can open spaces when you want to. Um, again, some good examples of such a guard would be butterfly guard, um, instep or shin to shin guard, even Delaheva guard, um, just kind of like vanilla Delaheva guard you could consider to be a hook based guard. Or even reverse Delaheva, but even usually reverse Delaheva always involves like a frame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reverse um, Delaheva. I find that reverse Delaheva, unless you have some sort of frame or, or clamp, your opponent can quite easily just squash you. So you, I, I don't think that reverse Delaheva by itself is, I would consider a hook based guard. I think you have to add something to it. Yeah. One of the, one of the main attacks from the reverse Delaheva guard offensively would be the spiral sweep or the kiss of the dragon. Um, it's a really useful tool to use and, uh, I think every, you know, if you want to get good at jujitsu, you kind of have to learn this attack. Uh, but I, my mind has sort of shifted from reverse Delaheva. I was using it a lot throughout my purple belt and even brown belt days quite effectively. I still use it, but now I try not to funnel my game there because mm -hmm. when I do that, I'm putting myself in a guard where I'm lacking a lot of frames. Yeah. Um, if I, if I funnel my, like if, if I were to, to manage your, uh, you know, if I was to manage my guard, just how I'm going to plan to use my guard with the different layers. And we'll talk about this 
pretty extensively in this episode, I would think about how can I man, uh, how can I set up my guard so that I have lots of frames, lots of distance management as my front line. And then as as my opponent starts to maybe pop, like maybe I have a De La Hiva, he pops the hook off and steps into a, like a split squat or a knee, cut, knee cut position, then I can pivot inside and start using a reverse De La Hiva. But it is somewhat of a defensive guard just because of the nature of the situation. So unless you're doing a spiral sweep or you're playing the, uh, the reverse De La Spider in the Gi, there's not a whole lot of offense that can be done there, but it is a very good transitionary position. You can use it, luckily, to get to a variety of different guards. So um, if it is one of your go-to guards, that's fine. But just keep in mind that you, you know, I kind of keep it in the uh, in the mid-range level of where I like to keep my layers of guard. For example, my first layer of guard in the gi would be like a lapel guard, because then you can have both feet on your opponent in the intermediary phase feet on the hips or the shoulders and then from there you can start working the lapel if your opponent breaks a, uh you know breaks that grip or whatever you still have opportunities to establish de la Hivas and collar and sleeve setups and things like this once your opponent usually breaks down your de la Hiva and steps into that split squat position now we can uh, concede to like a reverse de la Hiva. and then even if they break through that maybe you have to concede even further into something like a deep half or a half guard right where you your frames can be pretty limited so uh, always think about how you're managing your guard and think like when you're if if someone was to ask you what's your favorite guard try and ask yourself where in the hierarchy of the layers of guard does this guard fit into and is it the mm -hmm. smartest choice for me to funnel my opponent into this position yeah basically how many lines of defense do i have before my guard is completely passed and some guards are going to be much more defensible than others uh, which in my mind is part of the reason why traditional closed guard remains so well respected even after all these years i mean it is there's a lot of stuff you have to do if you want to get past someone's traditional closed guard uh yeah. whereas some other more modern guards they they have a lot fewer lines of defense up in front of them a lot a, few, a lot fewer layers so especially if you're training in the gi um usually if you want to add some more layers to your guard the gi and especially the lapel usually offer you some good options to do so yeah there's there's a reason why like say deep half for example why deep half is so accessible off of like mount escapes and when your half guard really falls apart, sometimes you can go to deep half and rally from there. Um, the reason that is, is because you are literally like kind of on your last layers of defense, right? So it's very important to like know the deep half, understand how to get in and how to use it to get to other positions. But like I said, playing like a Bernardo Faria game from like 10 years ago where you pull deep half or a Jeff Glover game, uh, you don't see that as much anymore. And that's because unless you're like really good at specializing the deep half and you know exactly how to move your opponent around from that mm -hmm. position, uh, you can get crushed pretty easily from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, You know, we'll probably get into this more as we talk about the other types, but going back to hook-based guards, um, from my perspective, one of the things that defines a hook-based guard is that you often have to play it very reactively. You cannot rely on the fact that you can control your opponent and where they move. I mean, think about it, right? When you have someone in butterfly guard, they still retain a good amount of movement. It's very hard to completely restrict and lock them down. Same with if you're playing in-step shin-to-shin guard, even, even De La Hiva guard in a lot of cases, it can be very hard to fully immobilize your opponent. So most of these hook-based guards, I find... They're good to play when things are still relatively neutral. Your opponent is does not have like a hard competitive advantage where they're closing in on a pass, uh, but just kind of where things are still sort of in the in the engagement or maintenance phase. I like hook based guards because they usually are very easy to get into. Um, they do, mm -hmm. they don't have a complicated setup, so normally they're a good plan A. But the thing is, you generally have to play them reactively. You likely will not be able to immobilize your opponent. So yeah. they require a very high sensitivity. And as a result, tend to be very hard for beginners to play because they don't have that sensitivity. Like you can't just grab onto someone and cling to them. You have to make sure you move wherever they move. So hook base guards to me, they're a good plan A because they're so easy to get into. And they generally, generally you still have all your weapons available, but they require you to react to whatever your opponent does very quickly. Yeah, and and another thing about hook-based guards is they're very dynamic. So yes. it's going to be very easy for you to 
do things like create angles, stay very mobile, and also to be able to play a hook base guard, you have to constantly be thinking about uh, off basing your opponent and breaking their alignment. Like Steve was saying, there's no uh, there's no De La Hiva where you can just hold De La Hiva and then your opponent's going to stay there. They're always going to start to disengage your hooks. They're always going to try and, you know, pass around and move around to other positions. So you have to have backup plans for when your opponent pops your De La Hiva hook off and creates different angles. You have to also make sure that you're staying ahead of the grip game and that you can keep them off balance. And that's kind of one of the first things when I learned De La Hiva, I started using it and uh, I was like, I don't think this is really the guard for me because I feel like every time I go here, my opponent just pops the hooks off and begins passing. And it's because I was never taught at the beginning that to use this, I need to successfully off balance my opponent constantly. Yes. Yeah. But if you know how to do that, if you know how to break their base and their alignment, then you're going to have a lot of options and a lot of dynamic uh, angles that you can play tons of different, different attacks from in the De La Hiva, whether you're going to go to like a, uh, you're going to pull them over top of you into like a single leg X position or into a single leg coming up position. Or if you take them to the other side and go for like a Barambolo, there's tons of stuff you can do from there. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things about a, a hook based guard is you're not trying to immobilize your opponent. You're actually trying to force them to continually be mobile. Uh, my instructor has previously referred to the De La Hiva guard as the Jello guard. Uh, and the reason why is because like if you play it properly, your opponent never Never has a chance to settle. You should always be making them wobble back and forth because as soon as they maintain their footing and can fully secure base, it becomes really easy for them to just pop that hook off. Same with pretty much any other type of hook guard, you need to have a continual approach to off-balancing and moving your opponent. Um, and then you need to be able to, ra- to react quickly to whatever happens. This isn't the type of guard where you basically just grab your opponent and slow them down. You need to just constantly prevent them from getting their footing underneath them. Yeah, and th- th- one of the other things too about hook base guards that are nice is they tend to be generally relatively low commitment techniques. I mean, you tend not to have to put yourself in a super bad position. They're, usually if things go wrong, it's pretty easy to transition out, uh, switch to another guard, or even stand straight up. So that's one of the nice things about hook base guards. And as a smaller guy, I like that about them. You know, I can go to my instep guard and if it's not working the way I want... I'm not like so tied up to my opponent that I can't move. I can usually transition or get up. So again, like you said, very dynamic movement oriented guard. Yeah. And and contrast that with like a clamp based guard where you're really trying to lock your yourself around your opponent and slow them down, whether you're in the close guard, breaking their posture down and fighting. Usually the, the, the fight is going to be breaking their posture down with like uh, a knee pull, like bringing your knees to your chest or, uh, and, or, trying to expose a limb across the center line or opening their arms up, right? So that, or say you're in a half guard with a clamp, you're usually trying to think about how can I get to that dog fight position? Or, you know, if they really progress deep into your half guard, like a lower coyote guard or even Mm -hmm. a deep half guard, you're thinking about how your leg is acting as an anchor and how you can, um, you know, use that to rally and come up into a top position. But it's more about slowing them down, immobilization, and then working from there yeah but in all of these cases one of the defining characteristics of a clamp guard is basically you're tethering yourself to your opponent you're lo- you're locking onto them and you're using your body like a ball and chain to prevent them from moving um, and really the thing that often makes clamp based guards strong is that kinetic chain like your ability to cross your ankles or do whatever you can to close the circuit so that your opponent cannot escape that's the thing that's going to make it really work um, this is why for example if you're if you have really short legs, sometimes closed guard against like a really, really big dude can be hard because <laughs> look, honestly, if you're in a situation where you cannot like cross your ankles behind the person, then that particular move, like even if you can just barely do it, it's not enough to touch your feet together. You need to be able to actually get enough power that you can prevent your opponent from moving. And if if you're in a situation where like your, your feet can just barely touch, probably traditional closed guard is not the best option there. Luckily, there are many, many other options. Now, clamp-based guards, again, really one of the things that is, that is going to make them powerful is that kinetic chain, because at some point you've got to lock onto the person. Um, for me, where clamp-based guards are very, very effective 
is as a reset. Like if I, if I feel like I have lost the tempo, if the other person is dictating the pace, um, or if I feel like they're, they're closing in on kind of like getting past my legs and working towards a pass, clamp-based guards are really, really good at slowing them down again and kind of like breaking their aggression. So very, very powerful defensive technique. Now, the one thing about a lot of these clamp guards is that sometimes because you're clamped onto the person, it can be hard to actually move yourself. Uh, that's just kind of one of the side effects of this guard. Usually there's a way to do it though. Like from deep half guard, for example, you can, you know, once you start getting some rotation, you can normally get to where you want to go. Often though, in order to really get where you want to go, you, you're probably going to need to let go of the clamp at some point. But I generally see the purpose of clamping on as a way to kind of slow the guy down and reset. So an example, Matt, of a, of a kind of like a plan B guard, as to what you mentioned earlier about guards where maybe some of your layers have been passed, um, a, a guard that I actually like is the lockdown. And a lot of people don't like it, and I understand why, because you've given up a lot of layers of guard, right, when yeah. you get to the lockdown. You're flat. Yeah, but that said, if you're already in that position, like I would not suggest pulling lockdown because that's your plan A. But if I'm fighting someone who is really, really aggressive and they've kind of got past most of my guard, but I can slam on a lockdown, I can probably slow them down and frustrate them and maneuver myself back to full guard at some point. So that's where I see clamp-based guards as being particularly effective. And you see this a lot in MMA too, right? Like when someone gets taken down or when they're dealing with a hyper-aggressive top guy, they will resort to a clamp guard to try to slow their opponent down before they will try to eventually escape yeah. so it's kind of like a, it's like a speed killer basically yeah usually if you get flattened in the half guard in mma the next thing that's going to happen is you're probably going to get mounted so it's really important to like have an option from there that you can use and unfortunately the half guard or the uh <laughs> the lockdown is somewhat effective it's really annoying to get stuck in as yeah. we all know so not a lot of attacks that you can do i mean it's not impossible but there there isn't a lot you can do from there simply because your shoulders and your butt cheeks are both planted flat on the mat like you do not really have a lot of hip power there but you can slow your opponent down and you may be able to eventually revert back to full guard so it's kind of like a a plan b option and a lot of clamp based guards like uh, they kind of fall into that bucket in my opinion um clamp guards are generally they're just kind of like a good defensive weapon across the board um matt i don't know do you have any specific thoughts on like when you would use a clamp guard versus a hook guard i mean uh i think if i'm going against a bigger opponent i'm not it, it well okay so a few ways to look at this right like uh if i'm going against a bigger opponent my goal is generally get underneath them and get mm -hmm. behind them try and redirect them so having a giant guy in my close guard it's going to be quite difficult to be offensive from there yeah I agree. um so i might opt to go for a hook base guard against someone uh bigger than me if someone's my size i think it's totally viable to go for like a a clamp based yeah. guard and, um, and clamp guards are usually devastating if you're the stronger guy like if you, if you right. have the size or strength, longer legs yeah 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 if you have the the length or the size or the strength advantage clamp guards are probably going to be preferable whereas i i agree with you as a smaller guy usually my plan a is going to be a hook based guard but i will go to a clamp guard if i feel like i'm losing like if my opponent is dictating the the tape the pace or if i feel like they're about to pass me and look i've got to stop this momentum right now then yeah. I'll switch to a clamp. But it is very hard against a bigger person to break their posture and effectively attack from a clamp guard. If you're now, if you are the bigger person, it becomes a lot easier to do that. So your again, your mileage may vary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, yeah, ex exactly. Uh, I think I think uh, it also rule set kind of makes a difference. So for example, if it's no gi and there's heel hooks and stuff i'm gonna be careful about going yeah. to a closed guard not that not that uh n not not that i would never do it but if if heel hooks are, are allowed and then i go to a closed guard then i'm giving my opponent the inside channel so they're now able to fall back and go for leg locks pretty effectively even more effectively if there's no uh if points don't matter at all, then there's no reason why someone wouldn't just fall back from the closed guard and try and reap me instantly into a heel hook. Right. So you do have to be careful generally when leg locks are on the line. Um, and I know that my opponent might be good at heel hooks. I'll probably try and have my feet on the inside channel. So yeah. I might opt to, to go for a hook based guard in that, uh, scenario as well. Um, but in the gi, it's very common for me to go for, uh, like a clamp based guard 
if my opponent is the same size of as me and i think that's more of goes along the lines of like traditional gi jiu-jitsu grappling is your legs are usually around the outside whereas no gi you see a lot more butterfly guard a lot more elevation because it's it's physically harder to grab your opponent and uh and get grips yeah that's actually a really good point that when you're dealing with a clamp guard Sometimes people cling on to it too long and that's when like they can leave a leg dangling and exposed. The trick about a clamp guard is that guard is only effective as long as you're able to preserve that strong kinetic chain. Like as, as soon as that is gone, if you're still trying to clamp, you're probably in trouble. Like th this is actually one of the mistakes that people often make with closed guard is their opponent is in the process of breaking their guard and they insist on trying to hold their guard shut when they have no chance. Um, that's a bad idea. At that point, you want to start transitioning to something else. And one of the worst mistakes you can make with a clamp guard is to try to insist on using that guard when that moment has already passed. Mm -hmm. Like you'll see, you'll see like Craig Jones when he competes, he takes a half guard, but he doesn't cross his ankles usually. But what mm -hmm. he will do is he will drive his knee, his, his inside knee uh, downward and have uh, a very strong frame as well as a pulling movement with the bottom leg. Yeah, so it's yeah. like that push pull. Uh, it's, it's basically a hybrid almost because it's a frame based guard, but he's also got like, he's using his leg in a bit of a hook as well. And he's he, just by doing that push pull, he's almost creating a clamp, but he's not crossing his ankles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, there's a, and just like a, even if you were to do like a half guard butterfly position, uh, where the, the top leg is the knee shield leg is actually on the inside position. A lot of people like Eddie Cummings use this. I use this a lot because it, it protects the top leg from a lot of leg locks. You will have the hooking abilities of, uh, the half guard with the bottom leg, but also, um, you'll be able to elevate with the top leg as well into leg entanglements and things like that. So Th that's a really good point to clamp someone you don't necessarily need to have a kinetic chain like there are ways to clamp onto someone without crossing your ankles or your arms around them I'm, as a personal example something i like to do if i'm sparring with someone who is just really large and i want to play closed guard but i can't just due to the size instead of trying to cross my ankles behind them what i'll do is i'll basically grapevine my my legs around theirs with my it's kind of hard to explain on the podcast, but I'll grapevine my inside. Yeah, I'll grapevine my legs, put my feet on the inside, and then stomp my feet to the floor and raise my knees. And this has the kind of the simultaneously uh, the simultaneous effect of double clamping their legs, so they basically can't stand up. It's a very very powerful thing to do, especially against larger people. Um, but so it, it kind of has the same benefits and the same downsides of a traditional closed guard. So in that case, I'm clamping not by crossing my ankles, but by stomping my feet to the floor while my opponent's leg is tied up in that stomp. So mm -hmm. different ways that you can do that, right? And the example you gave from half guard is another example. With a with a strong push-pull dynamic, you can often achieve the same thing that a clamp would achieve normally. Yeah, and maybe... Uh like uh, against a bigger opponent as well, like let's say it's in the gi, I'm a lot of the time I'll try and work my way back to where I can use my feet as frame. So like a, fr a frame based guard, like a spider guard, usually I have some kind of lapel or, or sleeve and uh, sleeve and collar gripping scheme with my hands. And then I like to have my feet either on the hips or, you know, on the, on the sleeve or the shoulder. Um, just managing the distance to a high degree with using my the soles of my feet as frames. I think this is like one of the best ways to grapple a, a bigger opponent, try and keep them away from you. Because keep in mind that the closer your opponent gets chest to chest or moves towards your head, the, you know, kind of the, the less layers of guard that you have as the person on the bottom. And when someone's really big, <laughs> if yeah. you if you lose your your frames, then you know, things can get really bad really fast. Yep, yep, yep. So that kind of takes us to the last of the basic types of guard, which is the frame-based guard. Now, uh, a frame-based guard, again, probably the most obvious example is like the knee shield guard, basically where you've put up some sort of frame that prevents your opponent from moving forward towards you. The reason why you would normally want to do this is because your opponent is on the way to a pass and you need to prevent them from closing the distance. Like generally speaking, when you are the one on top, if you're the aggressor, you want to take away space. If you're the guy on the bottom, a lot of the time you may want to make space, especially if you feel like you're at risk of being passed. So the goal of something like a knee shield is my opponent wants to come forward and probably wants to cross face me. 
I want to keep them far enough away that that's not going to happen. And and similarly, you know, if they actually do manage to get past that, then I immediately want to have my hands and my elbows up because that is going to substitute in as a frame. Um, a frame by itself is good, but usually the downside is you, you're with just a frame, you can keep your opponent at bay to some degree, but you can't prevent them from moving or getting up or advancing in other ways. So normally where you see a frame is uh, like a, a pure frame guard is you're about to get past and you're taking like your last stand. <laughs> so an example of that again would be like a knee shield or uh, something that Rob calls the spine frame, which is basically when like someone is about to pass you and then you kind of invert and you almost like a grand B and you use your spine as a frame against them. Yeah. Um, or also of course the, the last resort, which is you're basically passed and you get your hands up and you try to hip escape away. Right. So at this point, these are not the strongest forms of guard, but basically it's your last stand before the guard yeah. gets passed. Or if you're like getting caught in a double unders in a really bad position, you get your hips up and, and kind of engage your spine in yeah. such a way where it's hard to stack you. <laughs> Definitely not where you want to be, but it is kind of a last ditch effort to use your spine as a frame in yeah. that position. Yeah. So so normally your frame, if, if your guard is purely based on just frames, probably that means you're trying to just buy yourself a split second to prevent the pass so that you can reposition yourself and get back to guard. That's often what a frame based guard is about. Yeah. And just and just to as a side note, uh, I've been I've mentioned it a few times that I've been studying Gordon Ryan's passing DVD, and it seems pretty obvious that what he tries to do is uh, before he like uh, clears his leg out of the guard, because I used to I used to think that passing the guard meant getting my leg free, which it is. But it's also really important to think about flattening your partner out and getting chest to chest. So I noticed that uh, Gordon will always try and get chest to chest and then clear his leg. That would be like a tight pass. So is usually his first goal is to get chest to chest. And then if that doesn't work, if his part, uh, his opponent is framing and denying him chest to chest, he then looks to start leg pummeling and doing loose passes. But generally speaking, anytime that he's finishing a pass, he's finishing chest to chest and he's trying to get like a top side pin or, or, or he would be exposing, like, you know, you could go for a top side pin or you could get back exposure or you could, uh, get like a submission. So you might catch a guillotine off the pass or use the guillotine to pass. Likewise, you might use a Kimura to pass so um always think about like when you're passing the guard think how can i get chest to chest and essentially what that means is you're you're eliminating your partner's frame so just to give you a framework as the person who's passing chest to chest and top pins are kind of where you want to get to and then now i've had a lot of success when i get chest to chest i use that to uh i i go from there um, once I get that tightness, I pass the leg after I get that position, as opposed to like pulling my leg out and then I'm loose chest to chest. Uh, a lot of the time you're usually not pinning your opponent's head and shoulders, which doesn't create Im the immobilization that you need to stay tight and finish the pass. Yeah. That kind of chest to chest stuff is especially crucial when you're doing no gi. I mean, in the gi, sometimes you can get around it just because by virtue of true, the fact true. that you can grab their lapel or their collar, you can use that to compensate. But when there's no gi, if your goal is to like first disentangle the legs and then pass and go chest to chest, the problem is there's going to be a wide window there where there's nothing really preventing your opponent from just like getting out and getting up. Um, that's a problem that I have a lot when I do no gi as primarily a gi guy. You know, in gi, I'm so used to just, I immediately get my lapel or my collar grip and I know I can basically paralyze the guy while I work on disentangling the legs. But in no gi, you have no such luxury. Like you've got to have some way to keep the guy on the floor while you're trying to pass. So uh, mm -hmm. something that again is, I think probably an under considered aspect of the game, especially in no gi. Yeah. For example, like in, in gi, if you have the collar and sleeve, you can totally do a knee cut with your posture completely upright. But in no gi, if you try and do that pass, it doesn't work because you don't have grips, right? In no gi, generally, when you do a knee cut, your head is low to the ground and you've got an underhook and your chest to chest almost. Or, or, or your shoulder is under their chin, but essentially chest to chest. In the gi, you can totally do that knee cut pass if you have grips with a full posture and it will immobilize your partner. So it's definitely different once you add the kimono in the mix. Yep, yep, yep. Cool. So again, the three basic types of guards are hook-based, clamp-based, and frame-based. So hybrids. Now hybrid is a type of guard where you've got multiple mechanics in play. So Again, a, an example that you provided is like reverse Delaheva guard, where you've kind of got 
Actually, you sort of have two hooks with your legs, but you also need something more than that. Like generally speaking, with your your hand, you either need to frame against the far leg because you need to prevent them from squashing you, or you need to clamp onto the far leg because you want to get yourself underneath the person. Generally, if you're just fighting with your legs, that's not going to be enough. Uh, a lot of other guards, I mean, even standard De La Hiva guard, there's so many variants of this depending on what you're grabbing that you can often get into a situation where you've got a combo. Like the example you brought up earlier, the Della De La Spider variation, where you've got like the Della hook on one side, and then you've got like a spider guard uh, hook on the other side. That's going to be a situation where you've got a hook for De La Hiva on one side, but your other foot is going to be on the person's bicep pushing them away. So that hook plus the frame is a very powerful combination. So hybrid, and even for a lot of the guards that you would often think of as maybe just one particular type of guard, usually you can add more control by combining things. For example, if you're playing a butterfly guard, yeah, you've got hooks, but what can make that really powerful is when you get an underhook on them and you can kind of add a clamp. So there are very few guards that are generally just one type. Most of them you can add hybrid elements, and actually you should probably always be trying to do this because it's going to make your guards stronger at the end of the day than if you were just playing a single type by itself on its lonesome. Yeah, I mean, because we have four limbs, I think true jiu-jitsu, uh, most efficient jiu-jitsu, you always have to assign tasks to all your limbs, right? You can't just have like your legs framing, but your hands aren't doing anything. So pretty much any time in transition when you're assigning your, your limbs to certain tasks, you're probably always going to end up with like a hybrid guard and and having uh, hybrid guards a lot of the time are really good for transition. So moving from one type of guard to another, you know, as your opponent is constantly countering you and trying to grip fight you and, and pass, you're always going to be moving generally unless you have like a really tight lockdown or you're like in a dog fight position jockeying for that position. Generally, there's going to be lots of movement and you're going to need to be able to transition quickly from these guards. So um, another thing is is when you're thinking about these guards, especially I find in the gi, it's really important to, to understand like if your opponent breaks your grip, what's your next play, right? And so you're kinda, you kind of need to develop avenues and, and uh, game plans for this because if you don't understand how to replenish frames and how to change angles, a lot of the time you could get caught in certain situations. So a guy that I like to look at is Jonathan Thomas. I've, I've talked about him on the podcast before, but in the gi, he's, uh, he's really helped me just with his videos on Instagram about, uh, you know, if, if, let's say you play collar and sleeve and the guy stuffs your leg into the middle from Dela Hiva. Um, it, you know, if you don't have an answer from here, you're pretty much going to be stuck in like a, a knee cut position almost. You need to replace your frame by having a lasso almost immediately and if you you know for me like I spent a lot of time doing no gi recently and then I got back to to really trying to focus on the gi game um, if you don't have someone showing you these common problems that can happen a lot of the time before you know it you, the guy's chest to chest on you and you're you're in pure defense mode right so you just don't want this to happen it is important to know uh like when grips break where's my next grip gonna be and have a game plan for that like basically base up basically backup plans for your your guard strategies that's a really good idea i mean when you have your opponent defeat one of your grips or get past one of your layers a mistake that a lot of people make is they kind of just try to cling on to that and really the better thing to do is to try to move on to something else at that point like if i'm grip fighting with someone and they defeat my grip like they're able to just break the collar grip I'm not necessarily going to try to just hold on for dear life and sacrifice my fingers and I might not even try to just restore the grip that was already there it may be more productive to try to move on to a different guard that is more appropriate in that case and it's so critical to remember that you do have all of these weapons at your disposal and you need to keep them all busy so if you've ever got a situation where one of your legs is doing nothing or one of your hands is doing nothing or even if your head is doing nothing that that's an opportunity to power up the guard that you're playing because you've got more weapons that you, than you are actually using at that moment. So always try to pay attention to whether you've got a limb that is actually doing nothing. Now, that, that doesn't mean that all of your limbs need to be like grabbing or connecting with your opponent, but you should like if one of your feet is on the ground, it should be there because that is enabling you to base and to move like you shouldn't just have arms or legs or even your head just sitting there for no purpose. Mm -hmm. Cool. So well put. Awesome. 
So just to recap the kind of three types of guards that we've talked about as well as, as hybrid, um, the first is hook based guards. This is where basically you're, you're latching on or you're, you're connecting with your opponent. You're trying to check their motion, but often you're responding reactively to them. We talked about clamp based guards, which is where you are either making a kinetic chain, meaning like you're locking your ankles or your arms together around your opponent or you're using a push-pull to somewhat immobilize them. It's sort of like putting a pair of handcuffs on someone or a ball and chain on someone. You're trying to prohibit their motion. We talked about frame-based guards, which is where you are using a frame to prevent your opponent from closing the space. And we talked about hybrid guards, which means some combination of the three. Um, Usually with any individual type of guard, you can often make it a hybrid, uh, and that will usually make it more powerful than it is in and of itself. So in terms of the mental models that we talked about, I mean, we talked about the types of guard. We also talked about the the phases of guard. Uh, You can break guard into three primary phases. There's engagement, there's maintenance, and there is the retention phase. Again, we've covered these extensively in episodes 16, 17, and 18, so please feel free to go back to those. We talked about kinetic chains, which generally in this context means if you want to clamp onto your opponent, you, it helps to have a strong connection where both of your arms or both of your legs are connecting with each other. You generally um, don't want to have a single arm or a single leg dangling. We talked about dictating the pace, which Keenan, as you mentioned, Matt has referred to as tempo. Basically, when you're, when you're playing jujitsu, one person is going to be the one who is primarily acting and the other person is going to be the one who is primarily reacting. You want to be the one who's setting the pace. You don't want to be the one who is just making every move relative to what their opponent chooses to do because you're already on the defense at that point. So if you get yourself into a situation where that is happening, that's actually where understanding the types of guard can be helpful because some types of guard lend themselves better to slowing your opponent down. We talked about committed techniques. Uh, Some types of guard require more personal commitment from you, meaning that it can be harder to get out of them if something goes wrong. Often clamp-based guards fall into that category because you are tied up to your opponent. That doesn't mean they're bad necessarily, but it's just something to be mindful of, especially if you're trying to go underneath your opponent. Uh, and again, we talked about body tethering, which is where you tie yourself to your opponent. That's kind of the, one of the core features of a clamp based guard is that you're basically like using yourself as like a parking boot. So your opponent can't get away. <laughs> yeah. And for more information on this stuff, guys, we, uh, where we got the, uh, hi, uh, classifications of guards and types of guards and, you know, all, all this stuff is from Rob Bernacki. Check out his website. His online academy is bjjconcepts.net. Also, you can follow him on Instagram, bjjconcepts.net. So Got lots it. of great stuff Yeah, there. and if you want to specifically know more about this classification of different types of guard, the place I learned this from is actually Rob Bernacki's core BJJ formula series, which is available through Stefan Kesting on the Grapple Arts app and on the Grapple Arts website. So that's where I was first exposed to this classification. Uh, definitely recommend it if you want to dig into this a bit deeper. And I hope this was helpful. I mean, for me, I found this to be a really interesting way of thinking of guard. I mean, the main problem with guard these days is there's so many of them. I mean, if Matt, if we were to sit down and try to name every single guard we've ever seen, like it's just so much to hold in your head. And it's even harder to pull out of your hat the right one for any point in time. So much like how we suggest a concept-based approach to jujitsu it's nice to also be able to classify the guard in your mind so that you can kind of group these things into a family. And that way, when you see some new crazy guard that you haven't seen before, and that will happen, then at least you have a, an anchor in your mind to hook that off of. You can say, oh, that's a frame-based guard. And I understand the general idea behind those. And Exactly. Yeah. So that's the intent behind this. And I hope you guys found that helpful. Uh, Matt, we got a comment. I hear it's a good one. It's a good one. Okay. So you're going to like this. I looked at what <laughs> I looked at what you offered and I'm not impressed I have to admit. My gym functions on the quote unquote old and bad way of teaching with techniques and I must say it's been wildly effective for me so I don't see why I should switch to this method. He's he's talking about our method. Did we say it was bad to do that? Well, we'll get there. And his All final right. comment in in parentheses is I'm only one year in and a couple stripes on a white belt. <laughs> so <laughs> So, um I guess oh, Matt, God. I guess unfortunately, you know, we got to shut this podcast down. I mean, it's we been called out here and this thing clearly doesn't work so i guess yeah 
Sorry, guys. Erase yeah. everything in your brain from the last yeah. 50 episodes. Yeah, the, the the white belt has spoken, and this free content that we're giving you guys is not good. So yeah. I'm not impressed with your podcast. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I can actually, you know, to be honest, I mean, I, I appreciate any feedback, even if it's honest. I mean, this guy was respectful. He just flat out said it didn't work for him, and he provided the context. So I, I appreciate that. And to be fair, at I'm like, I understand where he's coming from. And I think maybe there's a, a misconception here. I've had a few people, and this has really surprised me. I've had a few people comment on our like podcasts and our content and basically say, you know, oh, this is not a substitute for real training. You can't learn jujitsu through a podcast or through email. What are you doing? You need to go to, okay, look guys, th this podcast is not intended to replace going to class. Like this is supplemental material to give you guys something to think about that you can use when you go to class. I mean, I don't think anyone goes to like Marcelo Garcia's online academy and poo poos on it and says, this would never replace live sparring. Like it's not intended to, it's supplementary content. So yeah. if we've ever said or done anything to imply that you should be like listening to our podcast and reading our content instead of training, please just like wipe that from your mind. The, the goal here is to maybe provide a little bit more information that you might not have received on, on the mats. So yeah, yeah ab absolutely. You 100%, whatever you're getting in the gym, I hope would be more effective than just listening to us talk. Now, uh, what this guy's really saying though, is um, he's basically saying that like the kind of um, ram your head against the wall, old school approach of just like getting bombarded with techniques. He's finding that effective. And I agree that you that, need both. I think exactly. You need, you need both. Like what we're normally talking about here on this podcast is kind of a top down approach. Like we're talking about, you know, you start off with the big ideas and then eventually you, you move, you migrate down to the specifics. Whereas what most traditional, really? I, I look at that as bottom up. Oh, well, okay. How I, I think of it kind of is like taking, I think of it as top down. And by that, I mean, like you're taking these high level ideas and you're mapping them down to individual moves, but I can see how you could see it the other way. Yeah. I see it as a, like a foundation. Yeah. 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 Um, so in, whereas for me, I see it as like high level. So I, when I think top, I think like general, but anyway, the point, the point is like our podcast is about taking concepts and then mapping them down to individual techniques. Whereas what a lot of gyms will teach you is a whole bunch of techniques. And over time you map those up, you know, hopefully in your mind, you'll start to see patterns and group them into ideas. Neither one of these approaches is wrong. Uh, in fact, I think that as is often the case, the best approach is to use both. You know, you want to simultaneously be thinking about the big picture, but also about the details on the ground. Yeah, I mean, you need you need to know you need to have techniques. You can't we can't just show, tell you what posture structure base is and then say, OK, go grapple now. Yeah, you don't, you're not going to know any moves. There's specific details to every technique so you still need to learn the moves yeah yeah uh, gary vaynerchuk a really cool business guy he talks about how like if you want to be a leader at something you have to think in the clouds and also think in the dirt like yes you have to think about things from the thirty thousand foot big picture view but you also need to get into the details or else you won't really know how these ideas operate in reality uh so i think that the best approach is a combination of thinking big and also thinking small like you need to be able to see how all of this maps together if you were just to watch like rob's dvd and understand the ideas but never ever train like yeah you're not going to learn anything um and similarly though if you if you train and you don't really ever think about what you're doing i mean yeah, you might be good at drilling a few things, but your learning is going to be very, very stunted. So yeah. all we advocate is a holistic approach to learning. Think about the big picture and the little picture as well. Yeah. Yeah. And also you're a white belt. So just show up. Yeah, that's also true. I mean, I, I, if you I don't like the podcast. We appreciate the content, but you don't have to listen to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I would suggest too, like if there's something that about this, that is just isn't working for you, but you want similar content. I mean, like we're not the only ones out there who talk about systems based thinking, like all, so many, many high level instructors will mention this stuff. I mean, go take a look at like John Danaher's stuff or read Josh Waitskin's book. Right. So if I would suggest that even if you're not convinced yet that systems thinking is a good approach look at like literally anyone who's like a master on the subject and maybe they can phrase it in a way that's more palatable for you because i i guarantee you that like five years from now if you're still training you're probably going to realize that there's something to this <laughs> and, and it helps to see patterns and understand how concepts relate in your head that's not a jujitsu thing it's it's just a fact of life
So fuck off is what I'm saying. <laughs> so fuck you. <laughs> but no, no, no. We, we do appreciate the feedback. Yeah. And that's, it's good, good or bad, we do appreciate yeah, and the And it's feedback. actually good for us to know because if if we're somehow communicating that like this is supposed to be a replacement for training, then hopefully now we've set the record straight on that. Yeah, very good. Cool. Matt, you want to go get dinner? Yeah. Our mommy cooks, cooked us dinner. Yeah, I know. We're too, Time for nummies. We're two big boy black belts who go to mom and dad's house to record the podcast and they feed us and it's just like being a kid again. Yeah, pretty awesome. It is. Um, so if like our mom, you want to take care of us, uh, you can also go to our merch store, bjjmentalmodels.com slash store. You can buy gi patches. You can also buy pretty cool t-shirts. Anything that you do there is obviously going to help support us. Um, you know, it does take a lot of time and money to put the show together. You'd be surprised how much actually. Uh, so we definitely appreciate any support that you guys can give. If you want to get more content through email, you can go to bjjmentalmodels.com slash join. We send supplementary notes and other details through email usually once or twice a week uh, you can go to bjjmentalmodels.com and get more info in our online database and obviously if you want to get in touch with us which we love to hear good or bad you can find us on facebook or on instagram um, if you want to send us any love letters or hate mail we definitely love to get it there matt also especially loves it when you send him hate mail so yeah yeah address what? him by name and talk crap about something specifically that he did yeah. especially his competition footage and he'll just be your best friend for life yeah go on my instagram Instagram and start commenting bad things you'll see me motherfucker <laughs> yeah, yeah. you'll you, see me he will show up at your gym i'm sure all right guys okay take care guys yeah. bye